Hey guys! Hey. Okay, um, <laughs> let us know all, I think uh, the sound should be a lot better. Um, maybe even too loud, one can hope, um, because I've got a new mic and we've actually managed to get plugged in. Sorry about the early video, we'll delete that in a second. We just had a bit of mic issues. Um, so hello and welcome to our February live stream. Um, we are gonna be discussing this book in particular. This is <laughs> a Kindle, but it has the book inside <laughs> it, um, which is The Miseducation of Cameron Post by Emily Danforth, or Emily M. Danforth. Um, and we're also going to be talking about some topics around this. Um, so you can send in comments to um, this video if you're watching it on the live stream or if you're watching it on YouTube um, or to my Twitter if you don't have a YouTube account because sometimes YouTube comments can be a bit iffy um, and we'll be checking those periodically. Um, I think Sam's just going to put a link possibly to this if she can up on uh up on Twitter. I will um, let you know when, it, it. when, it happens. <laughs> when it's happening. Um, so uh, for those of you who are reading along with us, um, this is quite a chunky book for us to be reading in February. Yeah, um, we may not did have not realized. realized, I don't think, that this was this long when we decided we were going to read it in the shortest I month of the year. I definitely didn't realize that it was this long. Because you didn't, <laughs> didn't have a physical copy of it with you. Um, but uh, I suppose we should start with just a very bring subjective this, bring this up Sam's gonna come lap. and do the technical <laughs> stuff while we're doing this um if you guys can or can't hear us at the moment please let us know because that's gonna be really really helpful because it's also you, gonna be really embarrassing yeah if you second time this is the second time we had some trouble last time because my my mic my internal mic on my laptop died as we started to broadcast and I didn't realize um so we're just gonna kind of check if you guys are oh gosh uh, check if you guys can kind of hear us. So I suppose first we're just going to start with um, subjectively what we thought of the book, um, whether we enjoyed it just from a kind of reading point of view. Um, any thoughts? Any what thoughts from Sam? Sam? Any thoughts from Sam? Sam has many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound intrinsically positive. <laughs> Sometimes all at once. Um, no, I thought it was a really, really good book. I thought, um, uh, it's the first kind of book of its kind, I think that I've read. I've not read a book sort of as similar in to that. LGBT protagonist, LGBT is protagonist, LGBT coming of age, Bildung's Roman kind of book, and I thought that it was done very well. I think it's for the audience that, um, you know, for an LGBT audience or even for a, a less queer audience. Yeah, <laughs> it was. It's a really good book. It's really well written. The structure. I have a little bit of a. It's long. <laughs> I think yeah, the structure isn't a classic. You know. Um, three acts, here's a beginning, middle and end, there's a climax kind of plot. Or at least it didn't feel, like, even if it did have these climaxes, it didn't quite feel like it was the proportions were in that kind of structure. I'd agree with that. No, and also I think, I mean, we spoke about it before. Um, we're prepared, guys. So that, you know, <laughs> we sounded all intelligent. Um, oh Lord, I've just had five notifications. So I'm going to assume that people are in some way watching. We're gonna, we'll look at those in a sec, hang on. We'll just finish our thought and then we'll go go and have a look at your comments. Um, yeah, we, we talked about the fact that um, in Builders Roman books, you don't really have that kind of structure that you get in any books that don't fit into that category. Yeah. Um, like Jane Eyre, the obvious example. Yeah, um, it's, it's hard to kind of have a, to impose a structure on something that's meant to be so organic and so human. So I think you summed it up best when you were saying that it's like character over plot almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which definitely. is a very like anti-traditional um, way of thinking about things. And, and it's a very risky way of playing things as well, I think, as a writer. Yeah, um, if you don't like the character. Because you have to like, yeah, you have to have that connection to the character, otherwise your book's gonna not. Can we speak slow? I'm sorry, we will do, yes. <laughs> sorry. We are... Okay, got it, thanks. Um, we Just... are to very fast talkers, we get very excited about things. about things. So we will try and slow down a little bit, yes. Um, um, so I'd, yeah, I'd agree with that. I think, but I think that both of us have also said that we really liked Cameron as a uh, character. Yeah, I think, I think it works because of Cameron. So we were willing to go along with, we're willing to go along on her journey. Um, I'd definitely say, yeah, I'd agree with that. She's a very um, interesting character, both because her life is interesting and because she as a person is interesting um not necessarily not i don't know i feel like she has a balance of believability but also being quite you believe that she could have written this even though it is a well-written book which sometimes i have a problem with characters in the especially in the first person 
who you're like, okay, but I don't, you wouldn't write this. Like you would, you don't, you don't it feel like, like this. Yeah. And so it, when you're, it, when you're thinking like, in an, an artistic kind of metaphorical way, it's a bit weird. Yeah. It feels like it's ghost written. Yeah. By, by someone who isn't the character. By someone who isn't the character. Yeah, exactly. Whereas um, this, I kind of felt like, which we will, do you know, shall we talk about that now? The film stuff? Yeah. It's got a very authentic voice. Yeah. Uh, um, um, so Cameron's love of film and interest in film means, I think is one of the key reasons why I think it makes. <laughs> I've just realized we probably should just summarize what happens. Oh yeah, for those of you who are, I was in my head I was assuming people would have read it. Okay, so this is we've we've gone into it like hey you guys know what we're talking about. Um so this book is about a girl called Cameron Post. Her parents die on the same day as she kisses a girl for the first time and it's about kind of her growing up story, her journey um through her sexuality but also through her grief and through her friendships um and all the kind of pitfalls and bumps along the way. Is that a good summary? I think that's excellent, yeah. So that's what it's about, guys. Better than the blurb, I think, actually, oh, yeah. on the back. The blurb on the back's funny because it pretty much tells you exactly what happens throughout the whole book. <laughs> so I was, it was really strange when you read it because you're halfway through the book and you're like, okay, we haven't actually got to the end of the blurb yet. Like, we, we're not, <laughs> we haven't got to the, like, what we think is the crux of the problem here. Um, but I think that's just indicative of what kind of book it is, like that coming of age type novel, that very, like, traditional YA type novel. Um, I've had a couple of pings on my phone. Let's have a look at these comments then, because I'm going to assume they're comments that aren't, you're an idiot, we hate you. Um, I'm quickly going to delete the video that we messed up so that no one will I ever see it. I think I found the new video as well. I'm going to put it on Twitter now. Excellent. Um, oh, wait. <laughs> my face is so close to the screen at the beginning. I'm so glad I've come back. I know, I think this is, <laughs> I think this is I'm slightly concerned that we only have the old video up at the moment. It's okay, I think this is it. Uh-oh. I just accidentally deleted the. Nope, that's the old one. Oh, is it? Yep. Oh, yes, yeah, 140. Isn't well, it? I'm going to delete it anyway, just in case. Yeah, good idea. Good idea. And then we're going to um, go to the. Let's pause that before you can start hearing two of us. That would be really <laughs> unhelpful. Um, we're going to video manager it and then we're going to delete it. Um, I love that we're so computer savvy. Hey, guys. <laughs> we're, we're really professional. Um, <laughs> Or not, it's not allowing me, not doesn't wanna, doesn't say it exists. This is very confusing. Okay, right, let's. Just go for it. I'll, I'll post I'll post using mine because it should be okay. on my Google Plus. Um, while I'm doing this, Sam, do you want to talk about the film stuff that we, we kind of started to hint on um, about her, Cameron's interest in films and what that sort of does for the. Yeah, um, so um, quite early on in, well, after her parents die, she starts to visit a DVD or a VHS rental store, I think, and she starts to re rent out videos at a astronomical pace. And um, she then starts to be a little bit, a little bit meta about all of the things that she watches. She feels like she. I, th I think at one point she says that the she instead of having the Bible or having God, she she used. Um, these films as a way of sort of like finding herself and finding uh, her way of viewing the world and a way to her parents' death. So these films end up taking on a, a great significance to her. And I thought that was very interesting because um, she then sort of later on in the book, you can see the influence on the films on her writing, which I th which is what we were talking about, how her voice is very authentic because she has a very filmic way of viewing her own life. And if if a character, w if it wasn't emphasised early on that she really loved these films and that, you know, they've really been sort of a springboard from which she can interpret all the events and all the horrible things that have happened to her. Um, from that, she's she's built a sort of, a, a sort of, not a religion, but a self-belief, a belief system for herself. And... And then uh, sort of if that hadn't happened early on, we would have thought this is not the way that someone really we writes. Talk, yeah. yeah, this is not the way someone really talks about themselves. But clearly she feels, views her life from a distance, doesn't she? she? She almost feels like she's in a film of her life and she's watching herself. Yeah, and there are some comments because I think sometimes when you have first person narrative, you're not quite sure where they're telling the story from. So whether they're telling the story with an immediacy of like a diary entry or whether they're telling it from a long time in the future and I feel like this is this is in the future because she does talk sometimes about you know I didn't know then how significant this would be or I didn't know then 
what was what was about to happen. So I think she's there is a sense of her understanding what that something is ha that something has happened and that she's reached the other side of it, which is kind of a comfort. Like I find that especially if we're talking about it's very reassuring about the ending isn't yes it? if you're talking especially if you're talking to like a queer audience a queer teenagers who'd be interested in a ya book for queer teenagers i mean of course people who are straight would be interested as well but i think for me this book would be especially appealing to queer teenagers looking for themselves and looking for representation representation of themselves that maybe isn't widely available um for me that's really reassuring that even the stuff that's bad she doesn't say you know i if if only i'd done this differently this horrible thing could have not happened to me even though terrible things do happen it's more there is kind of an acceptance that's already there which i find kind of interesting um, i'm just putting the last link back on twitter and i hope this is all worked out um fingers crossed um but she's there's also one of my favorite favorite images film wise is there's a section where she's walking down the hallway and there's a another there's a, a student who has um uh a poster with stuff uh stuff about the second world war and she makes a reference of like you know if this was a movie then the director would be zooming in right now being very um attentive to this and kind of acknowledging how petty teenagers problems are because look at these problems that people used to have and then she's kind of like but screw it because this isn't a film and my life is important to me and the post is gone now the person's walked away and now i'm back in my life where my life is the most important thing to me which i thought was kind of cool the idea of like almost very self-referentially being like okay so yeah ya fiction has a bit of a rap for being like oh it's just teenagers and teenagers problems and yeah there's so many more things in the world to worry about and then it, not acknowledging the fact that like at any age teenagers yeah. are like this is my work like this is the world that i have and this is what's important to me but at the same time i sort of feel like it's very honest. I mean, this is this is exactly what it is like to be a teenager, isn't it? You, like, your life is the most... The whole thing about being a teenager is you're growing up and understanding what kind of person you are. And why, why else wouldn't you be the most, sort of, if you were sort of, like Cameron is sort of looking in her, at her life and trying to work out what she what she's going to do with herself, how she's going to deal with all of these things. Of course, her life would be the most important thing to her. And I yeah. think that for every teenager, that's exactly the case. And even even as you grow up, you always look back and sort of... Yeah, and especially when you're talking so intensely about like first loves and first friendships and first time at high school, first prom, like all of these things that are like quintessential to like life, but especially to like the fictionalization of that life to the coming out genre in particular. I think it's really interesting the way that Danforth is like queering that and kind of having we were saying it's nice that she has kind of a balance between the storylines that Cameron has which are specific to her being queer and then the storylines that she has that could also apply to a heterosexual person and like the relationship that those two things have so it's like hey some of my relationships that I have are difficult specifically because we are two girls are having to be in the closet but some of my relationships are also difficult because one of us loves the other one more or one of us is more yeah. invested in the yeah, relationship. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, people. definitely. It's it's definitely sort of um, how to deal with those emotions, and I think that um, I think that 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 you can relate to that at any age and from any sort of sexual sexuality, you can relate to that first sort of experiencing those emotions and not knowing what to do with them. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, so we i'm like looking we made little cards as normal where we have stuff to do with structure and stuff to do with language and and themes like that so i think we've done a lot about structure stuff um yeah maybe talk <laughs> about language stuff now so the first thing i you come across like from the very first page for me is this place and the setting yeah like it's so as someone who hasn't been to this part of america and probably knows about it through saturation of media um i loved the descriptions in this book of place and of everything but place and setting for me it was so good as someone who didn't wasn't familiar with this world in so few words the like the essence that I felt I had of it was really intense yeah I think we talked about this with behind the beautiful forevers as well but 
You probably didn't hear that. <laughs> because our mic was broken. <laughs> um, yeah, um, we both talked about how, as English students, we find it very hard to approach a book without an analytical standpoint. And the first thing I notice whenever I'm reading a book is the writing and the description. And she evokes the scene extremely well. I think that all of the descriptions of places are done very well. And like you say, really appealing to the senses, the sights, the sounds, the smells of things. Um, I um, felt like smell and taste were a weird, I feel like smell and taste aren't often utilized in writing, or if it is, it, it sounds a bit like, hey, I've been, I've gone to a creative writing class and they've told me that I need to write, <laughs> that I like need to have this, this kind of like every sense thing, like yeah. you teach it when you're in primary school, you, you get taught about sensory description. Whereas I felt like it worked in this because there were so many places in which food was important, um, either because it was, it was evoking memories or because it was about being home, about new things, about things that were familiar, like food was such a big part of that, which I really liked, because I like food, but also because it's, <laughs> I mean, like, last time we were talking about how we had like an, almost like an in with the topic, because Sam had done a journalism course, and on my MA, I'd done, um, I'd done a bit of a course about verbatim theatre and, and non-fiction theatre, as it were, and then for this one, I did one of my research projects during my master's on theatre and the synesthetic, so smells and tastes in theatre, which is weird because you're like, theatre, that's sound and sight. You don't taste in the theatre, <laughs> that's weird. Um, whereas, is this book any, we just had a question, is this book any <laughs> connection with education? No, it's, well, there, it's in that it's a, a fiction novel about someone going through school, yes, but if you've just come to this live stream accidentally thinking that you're about to be educated about the ed about education, <laughs> no. that's probably not for you. I mean, it's an education. It's, the, we're educating each other about this book. Also, whenever you read a book, you can learn things. It's looking like a true English lit student. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like my my whole thing with when I was looking at theatre, I was really interested in in taste and and smell. And basically, what a lot of the research says is it's really really hard to talk about taste to use taste and smell in the theatre. Um, to create a particular effect because people's um, experiences of smell and taste are so strong and so personal that you yeah. cannot control how they will feel using them. And so also I feel, um, sorry to interrupt, but also when describing smells, you feel sort of limited to specific sort of words like taste in particular, it's sort of it's bitter, it's sour, it's sweet. Yeah, you have those. You have those limiting words that mean that you can't have a breadth of description, mm. which is possibly why it's not utilized so often in literature. But here, I feel like she manages to broaden that sort of what seems like a limiting scope. That's true. Yeah, I'd agree with that as well. I interrupted your flow, didn't I? Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, no. I was, I was basically just saying the fact that, like, it's it's quite. It feels like instead of just having these these tastes which are put in there as if we're meant to expect to like know what the feeling of those tastes was and to know what the memories are meant to be, because we'll have very different memories of particular foods which are in here than the characters will do. Mm -hmm. There was just something about the description that made it like really obvious to me that how aware Danforth was of the power of memory with the description of of taste and smell and so it was always linked to memories it was always linked to the last time I went to the fair the last time I was here the last time I was there and um what's interesting about that is that it was it's like this whole cyclical idea almost of like until we got to the point where this novel started we were waiting for her to go through a coming of age story it was just like this year everything's the same this year everything's the same every yeah. year i'm on the swim team seven years i've been on the swim team every year the fair comes to town every year the <laughs> yeah, yeah, so like true. it's just boom 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 and then this but it's I, like the, the reason why you that this starts at this start of this book i think is obviously because of her parents death but i think it's also even if the parents hadn't have died it felt like this was the age that something was going to happen. Yeah, I think that um, cyclical aspect to it is also sort of really interesting because she's obviously en enclosed in this very small town. Um, and very often people say to her, like, Irene says to her, you need to get out of this town. And um, later on, I think, I can't remember, Lindsay tells her the same thing. And she's constantly being told that there's more outside of her hometown, but she feels safe there. Yeah. Um, and sort of having it circling and going round, having the same things happen every year, like after having something so sort of 
unsettling in your life as having both your parents die mm. having that cyclical routine is clearly something that she wanted and yeah. she drew attention to and continued to pursue and that she created with the video store and things like that she created her own routines and the doll's house which i love that doll's house thing is so interesting to me the idea of having this doll's house that was like the outside was made by her father like the structures made by her father but it was never completed and it was something that they were going to complete together and then she makes a decision instead of filling it instead of either leaving it or filling it the way that they would have filled it she fills it in a completely like almost like a doll's house version of wreck this journal yeah is how i think of it yeah. it's like hey i'm gonna like do all these things and there's a point where when me and sam were talking about this earlier there's a point where she hasn't mentioned her parents death in a while and which I think is really interesting the way that the grief is tracked throughout the novel and I really enjoy it not enjoy it but I, I appreciate how it's done but she hasn't talked about her parents in a while but she shoplifts a mother and a father figure and mentions putting them in the doll's house and mentions decoupaging them so like decorating them with um bits from the obituaries from the newspaper and from yeah, the newspaper reports um, that she'd saved and so you understand at that point it's been years since their death so she's saved these things that she's never really mentioned to the reader that she's saved before and that she's decided to paste them onto this this mother and father figure and then she gets she buys the the daughter figure who is obviously her in this scenario and pastes it with um leaflets about grief about like teenagers going through grief and has a lot of about numbness and she says i wanted to make like a numb jumper or something yeah or a numb sweater okay. it's american um <laughs> that me oh, yeah. like that image of the doll's house where you where she's doing this completely individualized Nubbed. way of way of being artistic and having an outlet within the space of like something that she shared with her family was really like an interesting image that I still quite, quite like I feel like it's an image that I should be like oh this is the metaphorical image of the motif of this as like an English lit thing but I kind of don't I haven't got there yet and I kind of don't even care that I haven't got there I just really enjoyed it no I think it I'm I mean really it's, it's, a, it's a way of sort of um putting an image to the feelings of grief isn't it yeah um, what a lovely way of putting it Sam oh thank you <laughs> I know I, I can turn a phrase um, yeah, I think I think that they, they do very well. I mean, she doesn't. I thought I thought also um, we should probably talk about her family. Um, yes, the sort of surrogate family that she has in the form of her grandmother and her her aunt and people who she sort of projects into the role of mother figure, father figure. She she often talks about family, doesn't she? Yes, good idea. Um, I'm sorry. I'm currently just making sure that we know that we're not. Um, missing any comments or stuff from people but okay. continue with this and I'll sort of we'll, we'll multitask yeah well um, what we were talking about um, earlier was the fact that she um, her family aren't horrible people yes <laughs> she gets which sounds like a weird thing to say but in the context of a, a family that puts her in particular situations you know but... it's, it's not it's not a cinderella situation is it she doesn't yeah. have horrible stepmother or anything like that um she has a grandmother who clearly cares about her and clearly is invested in her future wants her to be happy and is willing for her to deal with this grief in any way that she she can yeah um and the same with her aunt who gives up her whole life in florida is it florida um She's, isn't she working for an airline? She works for an airline. So she's, she's moving around somewhere and then... else, I think. She gives up that job, which she, she she mentions that she enjoys. And then she says that she, you know, she's got this new stage in her life, which is looking after Cam. And she 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 really commits to it. She she commits to bringing up Cam, um, living with the grandmother. And they support this abandoned child together. I know that it's, they're, they're small, yeah. you know, I know that it's... Um, they're still family but it's a big commitment to yeah to give up the job that you've done for years and years to bring up a child, child. <laughs> yeah. yeah um and i thought that was really sort of you know it, it's it's admirable as a character to, that they would do this and together they live together in this house and it's not a traditional family structure um with the grandma as well and the and the yeah so i thought that it was really interesting to then have this this controversial thing happen where it comes out that she's gay and they send her to a camp and there's no i think it's like the lack of antagonist as well the idea that we don't have a here is the 
the bad character. Here is the bad evil aunt who's gonna like send her away. But there's some. There's like something. Yeah. Really sadly, because you never get the feeling that it's it's saying you know this is the. Oh, I think we we finally managed to get it on my the upload on my page. <laughs> or not, it's disappeared again. Oh well. Um, but yeah, you never really get a sense of you know ever say ever that there's an attitude in the book saying you know this was the right thing to do sending her away but often because i think often you have this difficulty in when characters do something like that that it's really hard not to paint them in this like really terrible light yeah well it, it, it we were talking about how it's not a binary book is it i mean yeah. in any sense of binary it's not black and white at all um even when it comes to sexuality i mean it's not like She's not, she's not like exclusively like a lesbian either. Yeah. Um, like she does have experiences with boys and one experience with Adam later on. She says she, she doesn't like have to pretend that it's a girl to enjoy the experience. So it's not like she's, she's she doesn't decide that she's a lesbian. She doesn't eat from the very beginning and then that's her story as a lesbian. That's more Lindsay's story. That is more, yeah, much more Lindsay's story. Um, it's very much like I, she wants to, I feel like it's very much her personality first and then her sexuality is something that's like brought into the picture slowly. Um, yeah, and that she develops. Like yeah. it's very much what I would consider a really well done coming of age sexu with sexuality included novel because I think there's a difference between a coming of age novel where you you decide to do all the coming of age stuff but the person is already invested in the particular sexuality that they know that they are so i think this would have been a very different book obviously because of the plot but also in terms of structure and character and tone if it had been lindsay's story um can we just say right now because i think both of us are agreed on this that lindsay is a badass and we love her I really and like she's super super awesome um Lindsay, for, like I was saying to to Sam, I want to play like my new life goal is to play <laughs> Lindsay in the film of this book, like which is stupid because I'm not American in any way and it will never happen. And so my life goal would never be completed. It's okay. It could, we could make an English equivalent, you know. Yeah, I it's gonna it's be. It's just gonna be me in my room pretending to be Lindsay and filming it basically. <laughs> um, I lo like. I th just think Lindsay is like who I would have been if I'd have been living in this situation that would have been me um it's kind of a joke amongst people that i just like being a lesbian is like the second thing i mention after my name and sometimes before <laughs> so so it's like it's, i feel like that's a very lindsay thing to do oh um, i wish i had something that i i like i could attach to my identity that i could say like when i meet people hi i'm sam i'm from the north yeah that doesn't have the same ring to it i know I um oh um D D Gianna is it Gianna? I here's the thing because I recognise you because I know that we have video commenting conversations <laughs> with each other, and it's like don't know how to say your name, which is really embarrassing. Gina, um, probably Gina. That makes more sense, doesn't it? Um, I never realised how unincluded I felt in fiction as a bi person until I read this book with a queer female protagonist. Good choice of book. Awesome. Yes, I'm so happy that you enjoyed it. I agree totally. I this book, which happens to be by my foot. Um, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit by Jeanette Winston. It's the only book I read as a teenager or beforehand that had a queer protagonist. I'd read a couple of books where queer people were like secondary characters, but it was the first one I read and I didn't like it. And that sucked. Um, and I had to read it for school as well. And that also sucked. Um, and so I feel like I missed out because I feel like this book, if I'd have read this book as a teenager, it would have made me feel so happy. Like, even though sh shitty things are happening in it, there's just something about reading about someone that's like you in a very casual way, almost. Cause yeah. Because I feel like there's not too much angst on Cameron's part. About no, the fact there's really, queer. no. It's like, it's kind of more about the relationships and it is about her sexuality. So it's more her angsting about like, oh, I really want this girl who I think straight as opposed to, <laughs> oh no, I want girls to begin with. She's straight <laughs> off, she's like, I'm gonna go to the video store and rent like lesbian subtext films, it's great. <laughs> so she's kind of has a very different feel to it. Um, yeah, do you know what? Um, I was trying to think while you're speaking then, if I have read a book with an LGBT protagonist that is like, like you say, 
the main focus of the story. And I mean, the only other one I can think of is the one that was on our list. It was um, Maurice, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but other than that, I can't think of one. I feel um, like it's, I feel like for me, it's probably because when I was younger, as soon as someone realized, as soon as it was like, oh, Rowan likes reading, teachers and parents were like, get her on the classics. Yeah. So get her on um, these books, which are meant to be, you know, the Brontes or Austin or books that are meant to be um, good Dickens. books. Don't give Dickens to a teenager for God's sakes. Um, Why? Don't, don't do Why would you do that? Um, but I feel like people gave those to me and those books, which are all pretty much written pre 1900s or they're written afterwards, but very male focused. There'll be, you know, Lord of the Flies, 1984 type stuff. Yeah. That, they're never going to have queer characters in the forefront because of just the time they're written. They just wouldn't have been protagonists in in these books. And so you limit the scope. And I think this goes for a lot of different well, diverse I think writing. They're, they're, they're not good for sexuality anyway. Any not of good these for sexuality, books. not good for gender, not good for race, not good for disability. Like none of the interesting kind of quirks of protagonists that we're allowed to have nowadays in publishing were no available. Exactly. And so I had a period of time, I think, when I would have needed books like this, that it just wouldn't have come about because I was stuck in a place where people were saying, these are the books you should be reading. And I was getting very bored reading about like Pride and Prejudice and stuff when it was just not what I needed to be reading about because mm -hmm. it just didn't connect with me in the same way. Yeah. Um, which is why I think there's been a bit of, um, not a drama of any kind, but I think on BookTube, there was a video that came out in January um, where someone was talking about wanting to encourage booktubers to talk about the fact that characters are queer if they're queer in the books that they're reviewing, because a lot of them would skip over the fact they were queer um, and justify it with a kind of like, well, we didn't want to seem like they were, it was something special or, you know, weird to include. Whereas I think if you'd include that someone was a boy or someone was a girl or someone was a was black or whatever, like you have to include that in the review. Like that's an interesting <laughs> oh, thing to yeah, do. Oh yeah, I got it right. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that? Uh, Gina just posted the comment. Um, oh, we've got another one from Gina. Okay, so I like how this book isn't like the character is gay, but this character is attracted to girls. Correctly pronounced there, Sam. Uh, the word lesbian is only actually mentioned once in the book when Cameron is on the way to promise with Ruth. Yeah, I, I picked up on this earlier i just want to take credit for this <laughs> um yeah and I, I think you you highlighted in the book yeah the first time she uses the term lesbian it doesn't come up for a long for time. a long time and i really liked that like um i not not because i have any problem with the term lesbian i just think it's like it's a really good way of exploring her sexuality by not attaching that term to it. It's about who she's attracted to, yeah. who she falls in love with, rather than the gender of the person that she's falling in love with for, yeah. for such a long time. And I feel like having Lindsay as a character is really important because I think it would have been, it would have been problematic if it had just been her and she'd have been like, I'm just not saying the word because we all know that there's a problem in media with not saying the word bisexual, like not acknowledging the fact yeah. someone is bisexual and just being like, oh, they're just a straight girl playing around or, oh, they're just a lesbian who's confused. Whereas when you have this idea of a bisexual character or a queer character, it's useful to have, or any, any kind of, of those sexualities, it's useful to at least have a character who, even if your main character isn't into labels, that you have another character who, who acknowledges them or yeah. acknowledges that that is a choice rather than something automatic. And I think that's why I really like Lindsay. And this is why it's in the diversity thing is important, not just to have the, you know, the single queer character, but to have a range of queer characters yeah, who she can there's, interact there's, with. There's such a spectrum of um, gay characters that she interacts with. And I shouldn't even use the term gay. I should use the term queer, shouldn't I really? Cause like they're not, yeah, they're not, 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 all, not, all, not all of them gay. are gay. Um, um, and also the fact that like none of, there's not like an outing of Coley, for example, whose name, Coley, Collie, I can't work out to say it, but um, <laughs> like I was saying to Sam, the fact in my head, it was that bit of the storyline was almost like a, I've fallen in love with a straight girl. And then Sam was like, but she's not straight, right? And I was like, she isn't necessarily, but she isn't necessarily not, not yeah. because she never actually says anything. And I could definitely read her as being a girl who for the rest of her life thinks she's, says she's straight, is straight, identifies that way. And there was just this one time where she had a really good friendship with a girl, was just in a really intense, like summer, my boyfriend's away, we've got some kind of tension. She's definitely attracted to me, kind of fun to be had. Um, that's because, especially because the big turning point happens when Cameron starts to talk about feelings and Coley's like, oh no, feelings <laughs> isn't the thing that we're doing here. Like, this is just 
sex like this isn't feelings um that's that i think is interesting to have these people who are existing on different levels whether that's having kind of sexual attraction to women having romantic attraction to women having a mix having a mix of different genders that for me was really useful um i'm just gonna fling off the stuff that we've already covered um so we've got these um is there anything you guys want to want to talk about in terms of this book actually i should point out um the questions we've had a few people saying that they're finding it difficult to uh, to ask questions or to comment on this um on the live stream itself yeah. um if you're having trouble i think m i think mainly i'm talking to brie Bri. <laughs> <laughs> hey brie if you're having trouble um i'll join you hey hey brie hey um if you're having trouble maybe try the try accessing it from my YouTube page and commenting just straight up onto the YouTube comments because we can read those as well. Because I do get like, I don't understand live stream commenting at all. I was trying to do it with Memory Heart yesterday and it was a mess. Um, so maybe go there or because I know Brie, you have me on Twitter, comment, go through Twitter because my yeah. Twitter's open and I'll have a chat with you there. Um, so if there's anything that you guys thought about it, anything you want to cover, anything you didn't like maybe, or anything you have problems with, then that'll be really interesting. Yeah. Um, before, while we wait for if people have any comments, um, the one thing we haven't talked about, but we did kind of want to talk about a bit, is the idea of banned books. Because I know for a fact Sorry, that there's more now. Oh, I've take, warm. take it off. Come on. Now we're not matching anymore. <laughs> um, the idea of banned books. So the fact that this book was uh, banned from being read in some schools. Um, I went to a talk with Patrick Ness, who's one of his books was on the same reading list as this and his book ended up being banned along with it just because they didn't want anything on this book book list being read if 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 they were going to read that lesbian book they weren't going to read anything <laughs> um so sam i'm going to ask this question but i know what the answer is going to be is there any circumstances in which you think we should ban books no oh there we go do, um, you, <laughs> do, I mean, do you feel like this there is an age it's like the daily mail should we ban it? No, we just shouldn't buy it. You know, <laughs> we just shouldn't. Just don't buy put your it. money into it. Fifty Shades of Grey. We've up. got to think of an American equivalent now for um, um, Fox. Fox. Yeah, I mean, we shouldn't <laughs> ban it. <laughs> um, I mean, do you think though that there is an age that would be that you would say this is probably the minimum age for for this book that um, you would say people should read? I it? don't know actually because I feel I feel hesitant to attach age restrictions to books. If you feel ready to take it on and to read it, I feel like. It's, it should be a case of like, you should be an active reader. Um, but I can understand sort of people feeling like, oh, there's too much sex in this book or there's too much rude language. Cause there is rude language, there is sex. They do smoke drugs, they smoke pot, don't they? Yeah. Um, and I mean, I could understand that audiences being hesitant about that, but I hesitate to attach age restrictions to books. I'd agree. I think like I'm a, I feel like kids are very good self-censors. Like if they're not ready for a book, they put well, it down. Uh, I was actually, I swear they were ha having a brief period in, in the UK where they were wondering whether or not they should have age restrictions. Well, not age restrictions, but guidance on books, like saying, oh, this is like, you should be older than 16 to read this book. Uh, okay. Like I can't quite remember, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, not not really mm -hmm. fan. In, in I think I, I'm a fan of having, um, guidelines insofar as the author because i know that there's a particular there's like book series like cherub which start quite young and then as you get older a child couldn't skip from the first book to like the 10th book because the it, it changes dramatically in terms of themes and content so if they were comfortable with one they wouldn't necessarily be comfortable with another so i can understand you know suitable for older readers or more mature readers if yeah you're, yeah actually yeah. if you're doing like middle grade books just to make sure that people aren't picking up something they think is one thing and then it turns into like something sexy drugs different. and, yeah. and suddenly they're confused but i think i mean it's the age of the internet there's a few websites where you can check for teenage books what's what's in the book in case you're particularly not comfortable with reading about sex or violence or drug taking or any of those kind of topics that might be might get a film a different rating for example um i think i think i'd i mean obviously agree with you for not banning the book thing i think that's completely ridiculous but i also don't I don't know whether we can ever stop it happening. Like, I don't think that there's no. And you know what? Sometimes like... it's a good thing. Uh, it has, or <laughs> not really a good thing, but it like it has 
positive results like a book that never was banned like was like a book like this that was banned it usually gets in the press if something's been banned That's and if point. it's got in the press then people are aware of it and it actually raises the profile of it sometimes so yeah. i mean like we know that the catcher in the rye was banned for for example we know lots of books that were banned that ended up being really you know defining books of generations yeah so i mean no. And also, if if you're a teenager and you're there's a big uproar about the fact that a, a selection of books that you were going to reread, one of them has been banned. You're probably going to go out of the way your way to read that book. If you're a reader or if you're interested in books, at least going in to have a look and find it and to look at why it was banned. Like, yeah, I feel like you're almost more likely to read it than if it was on your school reading list and you were just giving the list and there was no drama around it and you were like, ah. Uh, uh, so <laughs> like it's probably you're more likely to seek it out because it's been banned. Like there is nothing more tantalising for like anyone, not even just teenagers, than yeah, being something. told that it's something you're not, not allowed, allowed to, to have. Do. Yeah, not allowed to have. Um, that is a very yeah. That's a that's a very good. On on that note, though, I don't think this is an explicit book that should even even warrants being <sighs> yeah. Being it's not banned at all. I mean, uh, it's not like. It's not. Maybe I've just been desensitized I, I by know. fan fiction. <laughs> I don't know. I don't maybe, know. I maybe I'm so used just, to explicit erotica that I'm like, this is so tame. Well, I, I yeah, I know. I was just going to say it's quite tame for for me. <laughs> this is okay. This is interesting. Have you heard? Because this is something. As someone who did my dissertation on YA, I'm like a YA nut. But <laughs> new NA or new adult fiction is because it is quite recent it was in the 2000s that this become became a coined term uh, i don't think i know this okay term. so basically <laughs> it's like it's like acknowledging i think it's a new term because it's a new kind of book because it's a new kind of problem is acknowledging people who are like in their 20s and are still getting their shit together which is like everyone in their 20s right now oh hey it's us ding um but that, that was my thing the idea is like <laughs> ya stuff is like maybe first infatuation love i want to say or like first love but many people don't have a first love in their teenage years like i no. think that's a bit of a a weird thing no you, a weird pressure no, to I have think... to be like you're 16 you have your first love when you're 16 <laughs> like it's a bit of a weird thing even at 18 like you're starting university then pe a lot of people don't even date through university like yeah, some people i mean it's kind of a weird thing so the idea of new adult is that it's with problems that people have when they're in their early 20s which can include first love or it can include burgeoning sexuality but often it includes job seeking getting a ha get finding somewhere to live like finding your your path when you leave this very structured idea of what education yeah. is which is so it's like high it's always a high school like coming of age is always in a school environment or or no, like buildings roman was was a male genre for so long because it was so much about education and girls weren't in education at that time so coming of age has always been around education and then when you come out of education you aren't finished like you aren't done at 18 or at 21 cooking. like you're not boiled and that you're not a hard boiled egg you m might be a soft boiled egg and you want to be a hard boiled egg where am i going with this um but you so like there's this new kind of idea of a genre where young adults kind of extend out into new adults so they aren't quite established in a career yet and often they might be interested in in like do i go traveling do i do all this stuff that like they have the independence to do but they don't quite have the resources to do it and you have like that is where this weird new age of and often people are, are, are saying that the book that that genre is categorized often by a more explicit sexual nature in, of them so the sexual nature of the relationships are more explicit um so maybe it's just that like maybe we just want new new adult fiction maybe that's what we're interested in yeah maybe um, maybe, maybe we're like now that we're older <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think because um, so so often in YA books, it is about that first love or that term that's first of love, and I, and I think at the time you think it's love, don't you? <laughs> and you think, oh yeah, this is what it feels like. And it's only when you get older that you realise that actually that's something different. It's like infatuation or it's yeah. obsession, and you know, it's not like it's not the love that you experience when you get older perhaps yeah. or when you fully understand yourself because I feel like you know to love someone you need to really know yourself um and when you're growing up like that you don't know yourself do yeah. you um and that's part of the working out you have to sort of where you, who you are and love yourself 
before. Um, <laughs> oh, guys, this is turning into such a cheesy live stream. I know. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, I think I think that this book does very well to to deal with those first feelings. Um, yeah. And that transcends transcends sort of. I don't think that you have to be queer to enjoy the book. I think it's like you say it, it's 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 good that it's so relatable isn't yeah it? um for anyone who's gone through adolescence which is most people yeah i do feel <laughs> like we i think we touched on it earlier the idea of like all these problems that are happening on i mean some of them are specifically queer problems especially when it's like hey you're going to go to a camp to cure your sexuality but um many of the ideas of you know feeling like you have a crush on someone and like there's something charged and there's something going to happen and is something going to happen and whether it's the, it might be that you, that some, that's dangerous just because it's like a new romance and you're a teenager or your parents aren't into it or, you know, they're, there's kind of something just forbidden in the way that it's like your first time doing things. That can be just as relevant to, to like any sexuality. But I do think it's like, I'm into books which have a queer character that also highlight like significant things for queer people, whether that's coming out to themselves. I mean, I think it's interesting the like the guilt that she has over what she was doing when her parents died. Yeah, that's like, a really. I thought that was a really interesting part of the book. Yeah, it's like a good like jump off point because even though this uh, like curing you of the gay camp is horrific like Sam you were saying there's something in it where you're like this I mean there is some basis in a therapy that might help Cameron like through this stuff that maybe she hasn't dealt with about her guilt uh yeah so yeah like, um, in a really weirdly healthy unhealthy way but yeah I think I think Pam is very good at taking what she wants from experiences isn't she um that is a nice way of putting it yeah um I didn't worry about her going to this gay camp so much as I probably would if it were a different character. She's got a very she's got a very good sense of herself, I think. Even though she does have this guilt that she's not resolved and what she's not dealt with, you can tell that she's someone who can get through things. Yeah. Um, and the first thing they do when she gets into I don't know, what is it, anti gay camp? Should I call it that? What do you call it? It's these? like it, I think it's gay conversion therapy conversion therapy okay um the first thing they do is they make her draw an iceberg and she has to they say like this you know the tip of the iceberg is what you are externally internally is what's going on underneath in the you know the the 80 percent of the iceberg that's underneath the water you need to work out what's going on underneath i mean they obviously have a very damaging spin on it in that you shouldn't be gay you need to work out why you have these you know perverse uh, attractions but she uses it um shall we get your book and see what she says um <laughs> she uses it and um just to explore herself in a way um she says and her mum and dad she she highlights her mum and dad as a key thing um inability to accept their deaths the feelings of guilt and shame i have over their deaths um and i think you know she she recognizes that that's a big thing that she's not dealt with or yeah. that she, she needs to come to terms with. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously it's horrible that she's in this, she's having to go through conversion therapy, but she, she takes from it certain aspects that I think would have helped her. Yeah, um, I agree with that. I think, whereas there are other things to do with like the classic, oh, you haven't got a good relationship with your mother, or you know yeah. you didn't have it. like all of those things aren't as good but i think yeah you're right it's, you kind of trust that she understands what she needs there but i mean like i love the fact that her aunt has like the most ridiculous this whole thing about her aunt having um like these pink bright pink tools and things like that like, <laughs> yeah. it's so weirdly gendered <laughs> like like the gendering that happens within the yeah. book and if, of other characters, whether it's like, hey, this male character we're gonna have is gonna be like a cowboy, <laughs> or like this this queer girl character we're gonna have is gonna be a cowboy, or, or this like, do you know what I mean? It's kind of a, a really funny, not funny, but gender dynamics going on, not just within the queer characters, but within like all the characters having these interesting types of people. Like Amy is the stoner. 
Yeah. But we have like Jamie had more intricate, more interesting part of him where you have this like their relationship and the fact that he like it's not just this typical like, hey, here's the teenage boy stoner character who doesn't take anything seriously and is all really chill all the time. It's like, oh, he has his own ripples under the surface of his feelings for Cam and like what that's doing to him. And then he also has this issue, this thing where he's kind of says to her in this little note, you know, he realizes what he's done and he's like, I yeah. won't be shitty about this, I promise. Like, look, I had, I'd never told you this. I have a gay uncle this is not something that really bothers me won't out you like i like he gets it yeah i thought he was um you know i I thought it was nice to have that kind of it was you know it's it's very rare to find that lack of drama in a book yeah i like that i liked that he wasn't horrible about the fact that she didn't want to have sex with him and she didn't yeah. feel that way about him. You felt um, like you were like, well done, Cameron. You picked your friends well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, so for the most part, you had good friends. He, he. I mean, he was obviously a little bit. You know, he wasn't happy about it, but he, he was understanding, and I, I liked that they actually were friends. You know, friends who respect each other. Yeah. Um. You don't often get like male female friendships like that that's true and i i did like their friendship i mean i know that they tried to add that extra dynamic to it but like they it's made clear that they go back to normal afterwards um yeah and i, I quite i liked that i thought jamie was a good character um, it was a good step also that he was one of the first people to accept her for who she was um and yeah but even not for who she was but just have an accepting like environment yeah. for her um I like the fact that like he did it in a note. Like it was such a cute, like sort of romance. Oh no, no, Sam, you are on. Sorry. Am I? Like, you're over <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, we moved we, the screen. We moved the screen a little bit and Sam was like, wait a minute, I'm not on the screen. Um like I like that. I also like the like what when we were talking a bit earlier about queering the the traditional patronormative narrative, we they that the way they queered mixtapes and like love letters oh, was yeah. great. Yeah, so I was like, hey, <laughs> Lindsay. And it was funny because even as a queer person, I was like, okay, this is kind of like weird. And I couldn't work out why. And I'm like, oh, it's because it's coded for romance. It is, yeah. But yeah. it's these characters who are not having a romance anymore on either side. Neither of them are are really having this a kind of romantic relationship anymore. Um, but we're using all of these things that that straight people do to each other, which is like really cliched romance. But yeah. I'm just giving you, it's like, hey, I'm gonna give you like a mixtape and it's really cute. And, <laughs> hey, I'm gonna like tell you this film to watch when really it's like, hey, this mixtape is a mixtape that you're gonna listen to while you're like making out with all these other people. And here's this like film that's gonna help you to woo the lady that you want that isn't me. And here are these like, and also how easy the relationship was when she's admitting the fact that she that like um Lindsay sends her four letters to every one letter Cameron sends yeah but it's not this this it's not treated as a weird thing where there's like an imbalance between them and it's making it awkward like if it ever gets awkward they both know it's awkward and they're yeah. okay it's like okay it's awkward whatever it's nothing we can do about it let's let's restart restart this so I kind of liked the that like that element of queering of saying like hey here's this like trope that would be in a john hughes movie like this is the, <laughs> this is the thing that would happen it's like you wait for someone to like grab a boom box and like serenade her except it's in a completely different reason or, or way or rhyme from how it is traditionally in like the romantic sense yeah i like that um she subverts troops quite off tropes sorry tropes um quite often um and that was really satisfying because um, when reading a book, I, mean, I think most people are sort of thinking, oh, I know which direction this could go. You know, I know that how, you know, you can see how a relationship might blow up or something mm. like that. But that never happened in this. Um, actually, I, I should probably preface that with, has what happened in it so far? Because <laughs> I haven't got to the edge of the edge. <laughs> What's about to happen? <laughs> I'm nearly there. But yeah, you don't, um, I don't feel like I had a, a sense of like, oh this is the one this is the relationship of to end all relationship like i feel like if i hadn't read the back and didn't know that coley was like meant to be important like she's framed in the synopsis as being important i would have just been like oh she's just another character and i probably would have thought that lindsay was more important 
Uh, yeah, and I think, um, sorry to, to refer back to Lindsay. Um, don't be sorry, <laughs> Lindsay's amazing. <laughs> I think that um, Lindsay's an import, important, like, stability in the, yeah in for her i mean the fact that she does listen to the tapes when she's going running and you know in any kind of situation and it doesn't seem weird it doesn't seem inappropriate at all it's just it's, it's a nice sort of bit that she can bit of her life that doesn't change and she can go back to and you know it's someone who she, she doesn't have a lot of yeah and that she can touch base with and i feel like Lindsay's got that important role in sort of just offering a handout, if that makes sense. Like just, just offering. I mean, like... Lindsay's the only person who knows everything. Yeah. Like it's just that one, that one person, which isn't like n necessarily a good thing to have that like one person who knows everything and about all the problems that you're having, and then no one else really knows everything, um, or you don't talk to anyone else about everything. Like it's good that she has someone that she feels that like she can talk to. Yeah. But that's I think why why Lindsay in my head is so central to that to like Cameron's growing up and stuff whereas I think it's much more positive that this is a relationship but I feel like even though we talked earlier about the fact that you know Cam has an idea about which is 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 narrating the book from the future it seems like and so she knows what relationships are going to be significant I didn't feel like there was a very which I feel like there is in quite traditional heteronormative build-ups of romance yeah that it's like hey here is the ding the moment yeah and there's quite there's actually some narratives that are quite postmodern in heteronormative romantic films where they which i can't think of which one it is at the moment where it's um of stories of you know who was the one what is that there's a film with a guy and it's he's talking to his child about or a child about you know his their mum it's talking about their mum and she's like how did you meet her which one was my mum and then he you goes about around, how I met your mother no 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 it's a film it's a really <laughs> cute film and it's like, although yeah, How I Met Your Mother is also the same, <laughs> the same premise. The idea of like, it's ma it's making a bit of a, a joke about the idea of like, suddenly the worlds align and you realise either because it's really obvious in the narrative the way it's presented, but also because it comes at the right point in the in the narrative arc. In the like, this is the length of the movie. We know at this point is going to be the point where you meet the person. This point you're going to break up a little bit. This point you get back together. That's the end. It's happily ever after. Yeah. Like it never felt like here is me, Cameron Post from the future, telling you this is the most significant relationship. It's going to be the romantic relationship that changes me forever. Yeah, I that mean, doesn't happen. I mean, yeah, that's that's so true because it's not, because um, the usual trope is wrong person, wrong person, right person. Yeah, um, lose the right person for a second, claim the right person again at the end. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you have to have these wrong people, don't you? Yeah. Um, they always come first. And I feel like in this book, it was almost sort of, suggesting that that Irene was the wrong person that Lindsay was the wrong person but oh maybe maybe Corey is gonna Corey Coley 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 is gonna be the right person but it, again it's not it's, it then it's then the focus is back on the individual rather than the individual's relationships yeah um which is quite nice because it's like hey this is a book oh god I've got cramp um <laughs> hey this is a book about sexuality um and relationships but we don't have to like follow this pattern of you know, to be successful in your sexuality, you have to be successful in your a relationship. relationships. Yeah, like, like that's that. that's a cool a cool way of going about it. Thanks, Emily Danforth, for that. That was great. <laughs> um, my YouTube, for some reason, is not where it keeps giving me a sad face when it tries to tell me what the comments are. So I'm really sorry if you've commented and it's like decided not to tell me that you've commented because yeah. I keep clicking in it. It just does like one of those um like like. Oh, I'm so sad for you emojis. Like, there's nothing I can do. But uh, right now, the comments aren't working. Um, yeah. But that's fine. We'll just uh, go. We're almost probably at the end, though. We've yeah. <laughs> done about an hour. We've, we've chatted away. We had some technical difficulties. We've we've talked about this book. Um, anything? Any, yeah. any, any kind of cl closing remarks about um, this film? About this film, about this book? We're so into it being a film. We were saying how we would love it to be a two-parter on the BBC. Yeah. Like a two-part drama on the BBC. I the think first, the people would love this. First part up to when she, it's like, hey, you're going to this camp. And then the second part being afterwards. Because I just feel like, even though we are quite theatre people. We are quite theatre people. And like, I, in, my, in my heart, I'm like, oh my god if we could because we've we've co-written scripts before and um, i'm like oh if we could co-write this script and do it as a play it would be so good <laughs> but 
it just is so obviously a film this book like it's like all the film references her obsession with film the, like the descriptions are like you can see them on the wide screen you can see these like blue skies and these cotton balls and like everything is just so filmic that it feels like how if you did that in theater you would always be chasing film like you would always be trying to find a way of making the, the theater feel like it was a cinema and maybe that could be interesting or maybe it's like just make a film um so I'd be really interested in that. I am reading a comment. I'm sorry. Oh, we had Sam's like, what's happening? <laughs> <Sorry. gasps> um, but yeah, like I think it's okay. I'm gonna admit that maybe I need my glasses on to read. Yeah, comments. Sam took Sam took her glasses off to to try and like make sure her eyes didn't get overly um, dependent on them. But she's already hooked. She's already dependent on the glasses. We are one. Oh yeah, I can kind of. I wish I could offer a comment on for, to Gina, but I've I've already confessed I've not reached the end yet. Um, Neither have I. <laughs> we um, um, well, we have like we've as we arrange these, we do them on the last Sunday, and this Sunday just happened to be in a very short month where we have six days left of the month. Um, so I'm like, we're nearly at the end, but we're just waiting for those last few. We, we both Waiting confessed it to each days. other ashamed, didn't we? But we also knew, like, we, we went to university together and we knew that we, finishing books in time for actually be, having to talk to people about the books was not our forte. <laughs> we shouldn't confess that. It's every, like, no English lit student comes to all the tutorials having read all the books. Let's there's too many books to read. Too many. Um, but the comment was, on the subject of directions where we think it's going to go, I was convinced that it was going to end with Cam and Lindsay at Seattle Pride. Spoilers, it's not. And the ending left me in a really strange mood. Oh, now I really want to know. Ooh. But actually, having said that, I thought, now that you've spoiled it for me, because I thought it was going to end like that. That would have been amazing, though. <laughs> oh, my God, it imagine was... that being... If I did the film of it, I'd change the ending to that. I, because it, it, I don't was... even know what the real ending is, but I'm like, can you imagine that last shot of them being in Seattle like well it was referenced from the beginning oh, I really thought that was so the, the natural progression of the but like we said she's been subver subverting expectations from That's the very true. beginning and the, the structure um, and everything so that'd be quite interesting yeah um I can I can understand maybe being if you've got expectations of an ending of a book and then it not reaching that being disappointed yeah um when you think you're like oh this is the really obvious way it needs to end and then it's like oh or not yeah oh, no, that's not how it's gonna end um <laughs> when we finish actually so we so this is from uh although we just do, quickly read it yeah. although we do the live streams <laughs> <laughs> although we do the live streams we do this from goodreads is like where our main hub is and so when we finish we will be having a chat about it like if you want to come and join us i will put a link in the description below but essentially it's um ellipsis book group on goodreads and you should just be able to search for us um Ellipsis like the dot, dot, dot. I don't know why, we just decided it. Um, I like it. And uh, you can like post comments up on there and then we are also gonna be voting on the, well, we've we've opened up for suggestions for the book for next month. And because next month, World Book Day is next month, we are doing, our theme for March is gonna be books by authors from countries you've never visited. So if you have a country you've never visited, um, and there's an author from there, you recommend one of their books. Um, whatever book you put through to um, goes to a vote. So everyone, if you don't want to, uh, if you don't want to um, submit a book idea, you don't have to, but if you do, everyone submits them and then we make them into a poll and people vote. And it's just the book that has the most votes is the book that we read next month, basically. Um, so the poll is going to finish. Yeah, we do first past the post. Sorry, it's not representative voting. <laughs> this is a weird democracy we're running. Um, but we'll have, um, so basically the poll runs to the end of February and then on, on the last day of February, so next Saturday, we will announce what the book will be that we're reading. Um, I'm really hoping that we had a nice one this month because this was, in case you guys don't know, the theme of this month was a book about love. Um, and I feel like this is really fulfilled that, even though this was I, this was the one I, I was saying, maybe we should read this, I suggested it. Um, and I wasn't, I'd read the synopsis and it felt like it was going to be a book that was about maybe self-love and sexuality and stuff. Um, so I think it's been nice and people have found it nice to read about an LGBT protagonist. So I'm hoping that we can, next month is going to probably involve reading some kind of diverse book. 
Yeah, I really... In terms of nationality, maybe religion, maybe I, I really race. would like to read a, a diverse book again. I mean, I'm so sick of reading the same... <laughs> the, the same, same stuff over again. <laughs> um, so so we're, hopefully that will be what happens. Um, so if you want to join us, yeah, we're Ellipsis Book Group on um, Goodreads. And when this kind of manages to make itself after we've stopped broadcasting into a YouTube video on my channel, I will put that... Um, in the description so you can get to it. If you have any thoughts about this book, if you have any thoughts about what we've talked about, um, then post a comment up on there. It'll be really interesting to to, um, to have a chat with you about it. I'm gonna check one last time to see if these comments are working. Oh, we've got a couple of ones, but I'm not entirely sure if they're gonna load properly because we don't wanna have you guys commenting and then we just like completely we abandon you, it. Yeah. Uh, no, I think those are on a something else. They're not quite working. There's a lot of people adding me to their circle on Google Plus. I'm like, I only use Google Plus for this, so you're going to be bitterly disappointed. <laughs> um, there's not going to be nothing interesting happening there. Um, so yeah, so final thoughts on the book then. Um, would you recommend it to someone? Who would you recommend it to? Um, I I mean, um, I would recommend it to everybody. Um, I know that it, that's that's a very sort of you know, <laughs> cop out answer, but it's a it's a. I mean, if you want a book that's got a really interesting central character who transitions from various stages, you know, of emotional states. And I think it's a really well written book as well. You can appreciate the language, the tone, the pace of it is a bit slow, but at the same time, I feel like it, 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 it's not too bad because you need that nice pace to get to know the character, yeah. to get to know her family members. And I think that it's, um, it's rewarding. It's not what you're going to expect, but at the same time, I think it's particularly good for, you know, um, people who are coming to terms with their sexuality, young adults. Um, I think it's it's a good YA book, yeah. Um, but I like nice. it. <laughs> I like it basically. Yeah, <laughs> I give it a thumbs up. I would agree with Sam. I would say I really would like to see this on a uh, high school reading list. Yeah, um, I would too. Because yeah. I think it is a really good introduction to analysis yeah like, absolutely it's, yeah it's, yeah absolutely it's that kind of book where you're not reading a book from the 1950s or before where you're trying to like wrestle with the language to try and work out what they're trying to say with this it's like okay the imagery they're using is about film i get this it's like this is modern imagery the imagery they're using is about this family this doll's house like it feels a bit more relevant and i think it'll be nice for people who are interested in literature or people who weren't to like have an have an idea of an, analyzing good, something that's actually got like really interesting like figurative wording and language to it that isn't um that isn't a classic an old school classic that's a bit dry well we, we don't like the classics very much <laughs> no as english students we are not into that we're like hey old dead white men you wrote too much about yourselves and how you wanted to bang your students because you were all <laughs> university professors <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I think our conclusions from this is it's great because it's it's diverse and I think having more of that can never be a problem, but it's also extremely well written. The characters are really interesting and likeable. Sympathetic. Sympathetic well. characters. Um, although it has an unusual structure and might seem a bit slow, those characters kind of will drive it, drive it for yeah. you and will drag you along. Um, we'd recommend it for really anyone, any age, any sexuality. Although if you're younger and you're wondering about the themes of the book, then maybe hit us up and we'll let you know what kind of stuff gets covered. Yeah. Um, if you're wondering if it's too adult for you or if it might be too adult for someone that you want to recommend it to. Um, but yeah, I'd agree with you. I think subject matter wise, it's just a case of discretion, but otherwise it would, it doesn't necessarily have a reader niche, even though you might Think that the protagonist no I, I i i don't like this idea that it, if it's about gay it's for gay people yeah. i mean it, it, it is relevant and i think that there's a lot to relate to if you are queer but i think it might help people who are not necessarily homophobic but don't know people who are gay or uncomfortable with that yeah. i'm not sure actually having this book which is very might be very humanizing or you know giving you this empathy to suggest, you know, these are some things that might be different, yes, but here are the things that are the same. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I totally agree, agree with that, yeah. Um, right, I think we've pretty much come to the end of the live stream. Hopefully it was more of a success because the mic was working and you can hear us. Um, I am going to um, eat some cake now and then not watch this video in case I get really embarrassed about <laughs> us. Um, if you have any suggestions, ideas about the live stream, how we run it, um, if you have any tips for us as to Please how do. we are <laughs> meant to keep track of all of the places that people seem to be trying to comment, um, that would be great, technical advice. Um, as you can see, we're not really very technical. 
I d English lit students, <laughs> like wearing a flannel shirt, sitting on the floor of her bedroom is a technical semester. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, so I hope to see you guys on Goodreads. Um, and we should uh, probably also say that we will come back in comments with our conclusions of the book. Yes, we will. If you want to um, see our conclusions as well, we will put it on Goodreads. But if you're not interested in that, we will probably also put it down in the comments of this live stream. Probably in like a, oh, this is, I've just finished. What's happening? <laughs> um, so we will see you next month um, in March for whatever book we end up reading. Mm -hmm. um, and if you guys um, want to ask us anything or anything, the comments from this live stream when it goes up as a YouTube video, I will be able to access so we can address some of the questions afterwards as well. Okay, I think we're, we're out. Oh talking for an hour not hard for us we're very we, chatty people we like um cool so we will see you hopefully next month i hope you enjoyed this hope you found it in some way useful um and we will see you later <laughs>